and sisters, our text is taken from the book of John chapter 10, verse 10b. And again, I'll ask somebody else to look at the second text, second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. By this time, I expect us to be able to recite this by heart. Let somebody else open there and read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 for us. And I will start by reading John chapter 10, uh, verse 10 as a whole. I'll read the whole verse 10. Our text is 10b. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus is the one saying here, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Who are the they here? You and I, every nation, every tribe, every people, every tongue, as many as will come to Jesus, they might have life and have it more abundantly. And so this is where we've gotten our topic, abundant life in Christ Jesus. I'll pause for the next person to read Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. These are our texts for this topic. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power had given us, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by this ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen. God bless you, uh, my beloved wife, Sister Gloria, and God bless every one of us, and God bless his word. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, from these texts and the scriptures, God has promised humankind abundant life. From these texts we have read and the scriptures, God has promised humankind abundant life. There is unlimited, unending life in this world and beyond this world. Glory be to God. But this life is only possible through Jesus Christ, as we have heard in that text. Jesus boldly declared in John chapter 10, verse 10b, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Before Jesus made this statement, the second part, that is part B, which is our text, that's why I read the entire text. In the first part, part A of that same John chapter 10, so you could say John chapter 10, verse 10A, and John chapter 10, verse 10B. In part A, Jesus first made clear that the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. This is the work of the thief. Uh, often people say the thief here is the devil. Yes, that's true. But you know the devil doesn't uh, manifest with horns and long tails. No, the devil comes through human beings. That's why if you read Revelation carefully, you hear the beasts that will come, but the beast will come in the form of government. <laughs> of course, Daniel makes us to understand that very well, right? Daniel gave the full interpretation of that, but that's another teaching. At the right time, we will come to that. So Jesus here said the thief. The thief represents whoever Anyone who claims to give the abundant life because it is the reserve of Jesus Christ. It is the absolute prerogative of Jesus Christ to give abundant life. I make bold to declare to you in the Lord, brothers and sisters, that there is no one else who can give abundant life. 
There is no one else, no other power, no other source that can give you abundant life. Money will not give you abundant life. Power in this world will not give you abundant life. Children will not give you abundant life. There is absolutely nothing in this entire world that will give you abundant life outside of Jesus. No angel, no spirit, no devil can give you abundant life. So anyone else who says, I can give you abundant life, whether angel, whether spirit, whether man, whether things created, whatever they may be, they are the one Jesus described here as thief. And he said, the thief does not come except to kill, to steal, or except to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. As I always say, SKD, SKD, steal, kill, and destroy. But thank God, Jesus responded to whatever the thief has come to do. He said, I have come that I may give you, that you may have, that I may have, that we may receive abundant life. Life that is unlimited. Life that is unending. Life that enjoys the best of God in this world and beyond this world continues to enjoy eternal life in the presence of God. Glory be to God and his son Jesus Christ. So Jesus responds, as I always say, that whenever you think about SKD, still kill, destroy, you should remember the four arrows, four arrows. Whatever the thief has stolen, oh, Jesus has the power to restore. That's the first arrow. Whatever the thief has killed, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He has the power to resurrect. Whatever the thief has destroyed, whether by damaging or up outright destruction, what he has damaged, Jesus has the power to repair. And what he has destroyed outrightly, Jesus has the power to replace whatever it is. Know that God has given you abundant life. The four arrows, restore, resurrect, repair, and replace. The almighty God, in the name of Jesus, perform these four arrow operations in your life, in whatever situation, in whatever circumstance, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, only Jesus Christ gives abundant life no one else. Let's take note, therefore, about this scripture that we've just talked about, the text. There you will see that it is in knowing Jesus Christ and living our lives according to what Jesus Christ has taught in the scriptures that produces or produce the abundant life. Let me say that again. If you combine the text and the scriptures, you will come to this understanding that it is in knowing Jesus Christ and living our lives according to what Jesus Christ has taught that produces the abundant life in us. So you're looking for abundant life? Because often people want me to prescribe what this abundant life is. Here is it. It is the knowing. How much of Jesus do you know and can believe? How much of his word do you know and can have in you and believe his word? This is what produces abundant life. This is what will reflect and manifest that abundant life in us. Also take note of this, that both the knowing and the living, that is the doing of God's word, of the word of God, are both enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Both the knowing of Jesus Christ 
and the doing of his word, the word of God, are empowered, enabled by the Holy Spirit. So you need the Holy Spirit. And also, you get to know the Holy Spirit in the word, hallelujah, by doing what Jesus teaches in the word. For example, in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Luke chapter 11, verse 13, you know that scripture very well. I often quote that to us. Jesus said, if you ask the Father of the Holy Spirit, he will give to you. I read it. He said, if you then being evil know how to give good gift to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So everything is doing what Jesus says, knowing Jesus and doing what he says. So when we know Jesus Christ and what he has taught, by searching the scripture, that is the Bible, we will come to this abundant life. We will continue to grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and will come to manifest the fullness of this life. Indeed, as we said last time, abundant life is living the fullness of Christ, is growing to the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ. Glory be to God. In John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, Jesus said, Set the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Brothers, it is all in the scripture. So, this is where the gap is. Like a brother asked me the other time, he said, God has provided this abundant life as you keep emphasizing. But why is there so much gap? And of course, just like I told him, I say, yeah, it's just like students in the class. The teacher teaches the same thing. And one student makes A, and the other student makes a C, and some fail. For example, there are some people who would say they are Christians, born again, and yet they are still committing fornication. And they tolerate that of themselves. Come on. Is that what Jesus has taught? Jesus is so strict about this matter of righteousness to the extent that he said, in this Matthew, you can look at it. Just looking at a woman with a lustful eyes is already like uh, you have already, not like you have already committed adultery with her. And so, what was he implying there? That by the spirit that sanctifies, we have to be renewed in our minds, purged completely. So, it is searching the scripture, like Jesus has said. We get to know Jesus Christ and what he has taught by what? Setting the scripture. That's John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. Note it. Life and indeed abundant life in Christ is by doing what is in the scripture. It is by doing what is in the scripture. So you want to close the gap. Ask yourself, how much of Jesus do I know and believe? How much of his word is in me and which I am doing and willing to continue to do? This is where the gap comes from, brothers and sisters. Some of the best scriptures about Christ are recorded in the synoptic gospels and indeed all through uh, the scriptures. That is why we have been looking at the book of Matthew. We have been studying the book of Matthew. And so we have covered Matthew chapter 1 to 28 individually, right? And we have been doing that study, a chapter a day of the Synoptic Gospels. That's our scripture challenge. We are in a scripture challenge uh, journey in this year, this first quarter, to read a chapter of the gospel every day. So today we are uh, at Mark chapter 2, having completed reading Matthew chapter 1 
to verse 28, which we concluded on the 28th. Matthew, again, so we are searching the scripture now, brothers and sisters. And as I've said, the key is how much of Jesus do you know and how much of his word, what he has taught, are you doing and willing to do? This is what manifests the abundant life. So Matthew affirms that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. So Matthew affirms that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that God promised through whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. You see this in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Genesis chapter 18, verse 18. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 affirms this, that Jesus Christ is that Messiah, the seed of Abraham, the son of David, that God promised through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I think we should look at that because a sister asked me a question and said, God in the book of Hebrews, if I remember her question, was it chapter four or so? Promise, swore, swore by himself. And the sister was asking, what is this promise that God swore? I, I referred her to look at this scripture. So let's just touch on it very quickly. Look at Genesis chapter 12, where it all started. Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. I'm starting from verse 1. It's verse 3 we're targeting. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Go with me to uh, Genesis chapter 18, verse 18. Genesis 18, verse 18. I'll just read. Uh, let's add 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? 18. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Go to Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. And this is where the swearing that the sister was referring to. Maybe I should start from verse, okay, from verse 15, please, from verse 15, because of time. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn. By myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. Abraham, because you have obeyed my word, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. 17, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. In blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sun which is on the seashores. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. My Lord, brothers and sisters, it is in the doing of the word. And God gave it by promise, swearing by his own name. And Psalm 89, verse 34, God said, my covenant I will not break, nor alter any word that has gone out of my mouth. God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If God has said it, he will do it. If he has promised, he will perform it. And God promised he will give us a Messiah, the Messiah, the Son of God. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Quickly, Galatians 3, 16. The Apostle Paul here re-echoed this message. Now, to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he does not say, 
and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Verse 17, just to add something. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. <laughs> So when was the covenant made? Way before the law. <laughs> the covenant was made in Abraham 430 years before the law. Glory be to God. So Jesus Christ has extended to us through him. We have come into this everlasting covenant. This covenant that was made to Abraham has continued from Abraham unto Christ and unto all those who have come into Jesus Christ. All glory and praise be to our God. Beloved brothers and sisters, if you go through, therefore, the book of Matthew, Matthew shows with infallible proofs from the law, the prophets, angelic declaration, testimony of John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit confirmation, and the Almighty Father himself spoke from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. To know Jesus Christ, beloved brothers and sisters, pay attention to whom he says he is, who the scripture says he is, if you can believe who he says he is and who the scriptures say he is and obey his word, you will enjoy his abundant life. The entire, so in summary, Matthew shows us that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the son of God. And I want to emphasize this a bit. He is the Messiah, the Jesus Christ, is the Messiah, is the Son of God. So three things to pay attention to, the Messiah. And you can go to the prophets and the Lord, and you will see all that was said concerning the Messiah that he will do and that he will bring for us. For example, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The transgressions of our peace was, was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Note that he said, we are healed. He put every other thing in past tense. But when it came to the healing, he said, by all this that he suffered, we are healed. Hallelujah. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, re-echoes that. Peter said, by his stripes, we were healed. By whose stripes, we were healed. So, I want us to look quickly at Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Jesus Christ as the Son of God, which Matthew spoke immensely about. You know, many people will say, uh, Jesus Christ never said he was the Son of God. They are liars. Of course, they are part of the thieves because they want to deceive you and I, so we will not get the blessing. So pay attention to Jesus being the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God. Or put it in this order, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Let's look at the Son of God quickly. We've talked a bit on the Messiah in the past, and as I've said, the Messiah, the Redeemer, right? The Christ the one anointed by God to be the heir of salvation, to save us, to save humankind. So through him, we have salvation. Just re echoing but there are many things you should study. Now, but let's focus on the son of God. Hallelujah. As the son of God, Jesus Christ has power and authority and dominion and preeminence over all creations of God in heaven, on earth, beneath the earth, that is in hell. 
whatever exists as a creation of God, living and non-living, visible and invisible, spiritual or physical, Jesus Christ has power, authority, dominion, preeminence over all. Glory be to God. Everything created by God is therefore subject to him. So when you are reading Philippians chapter 2 from verse 9, and you can appreciate this, God has highly exalted him and has given him a name above all names, every other name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those beneath the earth. Beneath the earth is hell. So there is no other world in which Jesus Christ does not have power, authority, dominion. Every creation of God is subject to Jesus Christ as a son of God. And that's why there is so much contention about Jesus never said he was the son. He said it boldly and clearly. Some will tell you, oh, don't listen to John. It's only John. That's why I brought you to Matthew. So you hear what Matthew says. Mark says the same. Luke says the same. And John, the beloved, enlarged and elaborated on it. If you can grasp the position of Jesus Christ as the son of God, even if you were to make a simple analogy of a man, a rich man who is in the world, who truly has a son that is in his place, a real son. I don't make some fake sons. Some children are fake sons. They don't know what it means to be a son. Ah, a real son knows that he is the head. He carries the father's name. He must surpass even whatever mark the father achieved, not by competition, but in subjection and in honor to the father. What does the world teach today? No, don't be under the feather of your father. Break off, break off, break off. Rebellion. Rebelling against the word of God, yet the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your father and mother. And by the way, religious people have hijacked that same scripture and are using it to oppress and manipulate people. They say, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Means that parent in the Lord is your pastor, is your prophet. Is that It is not, brothers and sisters. Let's tell ourselves the truth. The Bible that says, parents in the Lord, obey your parents in the Lord. That is us in the Lord because of God. That's what that scripture means. That's why it follows up with the next line and says, honor your father and mother that it may be well with you. If you doubt this, then go to Colossians chapter three that corroborates that scripture. That's a teaching for another day. Beloved brothers and sisters, so Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There is that, so much contention around that. And why is there so much contention? It's because here lies the key to you and I manifesting the power of sonship that God has given to his son and Jesus in turn by the power of the Holy Spirit has ordained us to enjoy. This is what we're talking about, knowing the scripture. Glory be to God. Let me start from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Let's quickly look at verse 16. Where? So Matthew chapter 16, you remember if you start from uh, verse 14, yeah, he says, so they said, some say, John the Baptist, this is what Jesus was asking them. He said, who do the people say I am? And they answered. Okay, let's just start it right away from verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? 
13. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what did Jesus answer? Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell. Hates, depending on your translation, shall not prevail against it. Look at verse 19. And I will give you the keys. Keys, not the key. Keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Have understanding of this scripture. So here Jesus accepted and said it is the father that has revealed to Peter or Simon at this point who he is that he is the Christ, the son of God. And then Jesus went further to say, you are Simon, but from today, I call you Peter. And if you want to understand this, it's the same way God, as we read in um, Genesis chapter 17, God said to Abraham, from today, you are no longer Abraham, you are Abraham. For you will be the father of many nations, or you are the father of many nations. Through you, my covenant is with you. My covenant is with you. And so Jesus Christ said, Peter, or Simon, they read. Simon means they read. An unstable person, and you've seen the character of Peter. He even denied Jesus, and Jesus knew he will deny him. Oh, that's why the Bible says that a wavering man cannot please God. Because he that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek. He that comes to him must come to him in faith. And by faith, believe God. And never wavering. So Peter was a wavering man. Or Simon, rather. Simon was a wavering man. They read. The least opportunity he has. He will deny. Even after the Holy Spirit came upon him in Acts, you will still see Peter manifest small of himself. Paul had to rebuke him and say, Peter, you were here with us. You did everything we did. Now that the Jews have come, you have suddenly changed. Peter, you want to be Simon again? Anyway, so what was Jesus saying here? Jesus declared and said, from today, you are no longer Simon. I mean, you are no, yes, you are no longer Simon the Reed. You are now Peter, the rock, the one who will stand firm. And upon this firmness, upon this standing, upon these principles, you stand upon the principles of my word. I will build my church. I hear people say Peter is the foundation of the church. No, Peter isn't the foundation. Jesus remains the foundation of his church. He said, I will build my church. But he said, I will start with you, Peter. And that will require me changing you from the reed to the rock that stands. Oh, and you can see that same Peter. That shaky, shaky Peter. The one that ordinary servants say, ah, you look like one of them. Your word betrays you. Peter said, God forbid it. Me, I don't even know that man. <laughs> he denied Christ. But here was Peter that said, elders of the Jews, men and brethren, if it is by the good work that has been done to a lame man that you are wondering by what means he has been made whole, know it that it is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one whom you despise, the one whom you kill. Oh, glory be to God. Peter, the rock. And Jesus went further 
and said, I will give you the keys. What do the keys mean? The keys mean the principles of the kingdom of heaven, the word of God, the teaching of Christ, the principles. So when you hear people say, I bind, whatever I bind on earth, are you binding by the principle of the kingdom of God? If you're not, then know that you're just speaking your own. <laughs> so that's why many prophecies that people say they're prophesying, they come to nothing because they say they speak the word of God as is in the Bible, and that is prophecy. That's true, but is that what God has said you should do in that moment and that instance? And some speak their word, they say, because they are prophets. Whatever they say will come to pass. Well, let's speak the word of God. Okay, back to the word. So the principles of the kingdom. Now, so at, in the day of Pentecost, you saw Peter stood up as Jesus said, through him, he will build his church. And the church grew. So what happened? Every one of us, therefore, who have come to Christ, have been built in the same principle of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I thought somebody would shout amen. The keys, the same keys that God gave to Peter, Jesus gave to Peter the keys of the kingdom are the same keys given to you. And of course, you can see that in the book of Acts. All the other apostles operated with the same keys and they had the same result. Even a man like Stephen, he was a deacon. Philip, oh, God used them and did mighty things. Are you following? Glory be to God. So Matthew ran through. I want to run through the Son of God in the book of Matthew. So you will see, let your eyes be open and today be bold. Because God has given us, has made us heirs, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. So the book of Matthew, talking about the Son of God, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, first of all, of course, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, you already have a reference there. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 6. You remember, Satan said, if you are the Son of God, turn this bread to stone. And then he followed in verse 6, if you're the son of God, you know, bow down, worship me, I will give you everything. So how did the devil know he was the son of God? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, God announced his son. God announced, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. You will see that in the follow-up at the Mount of Transfiguration. So I brought the two together, which is, I believe, Matthew chapter 17. So... Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, demons recognized him as the son of God. Hear what they said. Matthew 8, 29, and behold, they cried out saying, what have, we do, uh, what have we to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of God, art thou come hither to torment us before the time? I'm reading King James Version. If you go to Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, after those in the ship worship him saying, the son of the living God. He said, of a truth, thou art the son of God. Matthew chapter 14, verse 33. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, where we have just read, Peter spoke, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 to 64. Let's go there and read it together. But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us, if you are the Christ, the Son of God. 64, Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting in the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Who is this Jesus? The Son of of the living God. Matthew chapter 27, passers by said to him, if you are the son of God. Matthew 27, 40, passers by. They said the same thing. If you are the son of God. 27, 43, 27, 43. They said he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, 
They said, Jesus said, I am the son of God. Matthew 27, 54. After they crucified Jesus, things began to happen. The whole world turned dark. There was earthquake. The rocks broke in pieces. The temple veil tore from top to bottom. And the centurion and others saw this. Matthew 27, 54, and they declared, truly, this was the Son of God. Beloved brothers and sisters, it didn't end there. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus came out of the grave. <laughs> oh, glory be to God. He rose from the dead. And in chapter 8, I mean verse 18, 19 and 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He said, go therefore, this is the command. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. What are we to teach and what must we do? All things that Jesus has taught, has spoken, has commanded. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Why? Because I am Emmanuel. That's his name. God with us. Ah. He rose from the dead as a son of God. He had power and has power to forgive sin. Even while he was on earth, he demonstrated that power. He forgives sin. As the son of God, he rose from the dead to show to the whole world that he is the only one who has power over death. And therefore has power to give abundant life. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And while he was on earth, he raised the dead. He brought Lazarus from the dead after four days. He reconstructed the re decomposed body to show to us that at the resurrection, so he will reconstruct us. Even though we have died, rotten, become dust, some are criminated, it doesn't matter what way, what form. He has power to recreate, to rebuild, to repair. Remember, he is the son of God. So now, brothers and sisters, he gives you, he now gives you and I the power. He gives us the power to do everything he did, everything he has done. He has given us the power to do them. And he is also the one still doing them in us and through us. So Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 8 shows how he demonstrated this through his disciples. Matthew 10, 1 through 8. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. This wasn't when he died and rose. Though. This was while he was still on earth. So whomever Jesus said go, he gives power. As he promised there in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, when he rose from the dead. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. So Jesus demonstrated this, and when he rose from the dead, he expanded this, he said, now go to all nations, all people, and do the same, heal the sick, cast out devil, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, freely you have received, freely give. Beloved brothers and sisters, next Sunday, we, we are going to pray for the sick because Jesus is with us. He will heal all. And you believe God. The Son of God has given us the power, the authority to do his will. God bless you. Wherever you are hearing this word, may you surrender your life now to Jesus the son of the living God, the Messiah, the Christ, the savior of all humankind. It's only through him 
we have abundant life. God bless you.